Hey, what's going on, gang? This is Nate on the Stone. Welcome back to my channel, and welcome to the 44th episode of The Rolling Stone. You guys all know the drill. Uh, in case there are any people who are watching my videos for the first time, to all of you guys, hi, welcome. Um, these videos are a little different from the ones that I post every other week normally on Tuesday when my microphone doesn't die, FYI, but that's another story. Um, there are very few cuts, clips, or anything like that that I put in my other um, videos. These are really just my initial thoughts and impressions about stories that have been in the news cycle in the past week. So now that we're all up to speed on this, let us start with a story from Hollywood, USA. Tinseltown, or what used to be Tinseltown. It's sort of the decaying remains of Tinseltown, if you ask my opinion. But specifically, the uh, movie giants Marvel Entertainment slash Disney and Sony Pictures. So, the scuttlebutt is, in, back in September, this isn't scuttlebutt actually anymore, it has been confirmed. Last September, um, it was reported in The Hollywood Reporter that Marvel and Sony were making a deal, okay, so that Tom Holland would actually make a Spider-Man movie for Sony, right? Because as you probably um, know, Sony had the rights to Spider-Man, which is why Spider-Man didn't appear in the MCU until Captain America Civil War, right? Sony was making all the Spider-Man movies, whether it was with uh, Tobey Maguire or whether it was with Andrew Garfield. And then Spider-Man went to the MCU and Sony said, okay, there's not going to be any more Spider-Man movies on our side, but we are going to make a cinematic Spider-Man universe just without Spider-Man. I still don't exactly know how they were going to make that work, but last year's Venom with Tom Hardy was supposed to be a part of that. And this year, in October as well, Sony is releasing their movie of Morbius, The Living Vampire. Well, now Marvel and Sony are in a deal because there was some sort of disagreement between the two studios in the summer pretty soon after Spider-Man Far From Home was released and then both studios said nope that's it Spider-Man he's just not going to be in any more movies because we can't agree well apparently now Sony and Marvel Disney or Disney Marvel has uh smoothed over those disagreements and Tom Holland is set to actually go to Sony to star in a live action Spider-Man movie so why is this a story, you're probably wondering. Well, it's because the Spider-Man that we see now, he's going to be different from how we've seen Spider-Man previously, okay? According to uh, the Christian Post, quote, The entertainment blog We Got This Covered said, citing anonymous but reliable sources, that Sony is developing a live-action Spider-Verse movie that would unite Holland with his predecessors, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, and that the studio is particularly keen on getting Garfield back as they want to portray his version of the hero as bisexual and give him a boyfriend in the film. Okay, so apparently they want to do a live-action version of Into the Spider-Verse, which was immensely popular. I mean, hugely popular. It's the best Spider-Man movie that's ever been made, in my humble opinion. Now they want to do the same thing on the live-action version, have all these alternate Spider-Man from different directions, and they want Andrew Garfield Spider-Man to be bisexual, even though in Amazing Spider-Man and Amazing Spider-Man 2, there was absolutely no, no indication that he was by. He had a crush on Gwen Stacy. Gwen, they were together at the end of the first movie. Gwen Stacy died at the climax of the last movie. And I think that that movie was also where they introduced Mary Jane. So, I mean, they were actually following the comics. They were actually doing what comic book movies are supposed to do, follow the comics. Um, all that's going to be cleared now. And now, apparently Sony wants to make Andrew Garfield Spider-Man bisexual. Now, uh, last year, in the Sunday Times, Tom Holland, okay, he was asked if uh, a gay Spider-Man could make it 
into the movies. And Tom Holland said, quote, Of course, I can't talk about the future of the character because honestly, I don't know and it's out of my hands. But I do know a lot about the future of Marvel and they are going to be representing a lot of different people in the next few years. The world isn't as simple as straight white guy. It doesn't end there and these films need to represent more than one type of person, unquote. So there you have it. The whole... I do not put any stock in, you know, representation, as it were. I think that if you have a good character and that if he um, exhibits universal virtues that speak to human nature, that speak to um, the better angels of our nature, as Abraham Lincoln said, it is still his birthday month, February, so I will quote him, then you don't need you know, representation. You don't need, oh, you know, we have to have a certain percentage of characters who are gay, a certain percentage of characters, you know, who are bisexual, a certain uh, percentage of characters now who are aero, aerosexual. I think that that's how I'm pronouncing it, uh, which is especially going to become more and more problematic to use a word that is popular on the left when the Rainbow Coalition keeps growing and growing and keeping, you know, and keeps adding letters to it right? But even that isn't the real story, okay? Even that's not the real story. The real story is that Sony and Marvel are going in this woke direction when this is adamantly what Stan Lee did not want. You know, the whole guy who created, pretty much, the Marvel Universe from his own imagination, Stan Lee, that guy, the guy who has only been dead for about 15 months, that's Stan Lee. He didn't want this sort of, uh, you know, modernized, woke reinterpretations of his and Marvel's characters. As reported in the UK Guardian back in 2015, in an interview, Stan Lee said, quote, I think the world has a place for gay superheroes, certainly, but again, I don't see any reason to change the sexual proclivities of a character once they've already been established. I have no problem with creating new homosexual superheroes. It has nothing to do with being anti-gay or anti-black or anti-Latino or anything like that. Latino characters should stay Latino. The Black Panther should certainly not be Swiss. I just see no reason to change that which has already been established when it's so easy to add new characters. I say create new characters the way you want to. Hell, I'll do it myself." Unquote. Okay. But there it is. There it is. In, in, in the good old, uh, you know, in the world of Hollywood today, these studios couldn't wait 15 months. Again, Stan Lee died in November of 2018. November 12th, I believe. And they couldn't start waiting. They couldn't even wait two years. Two years! Before they started dumping all over Stan Lee's life work. Okay? Now, what is the big deal about this? Well, the big deal is that Stan Lee's work, the characters that he created... Those are the only really ways that we're going to remember him. That's his legacy. All of the characters he created. Now, um, it's sort of in dispute how many characters he did create. Again, in the wild, woolly days of the comic book industry, um, you know, credit for certain characters was not always a hard and fast line. And it gets in when there was so much collaboration between writers and artists and just people, you know, brainstorming ideas, you know, um, it gets very hard to definitely pinpoint, okay, this person created this character at this time. This person created this character at this time. But... I was looking on, um, I was doing some research actually for this Rolling Stone, and it seems as if Stan Lee can definitely be created with 199 characters in the Marvel Universe, okay? 199 characters. That is phenomenal, okay? That's phenomenal in and of itself. Almost 200 characters, and even then, if we wanted to kind of play it safe and cut that number in half, 100 characters. A hundred characters, which include characters like Thor, Spider-Man, uh, Iron Man, Doctor Strange, 
right? Household names now. The Incredible Hulk, okay? Household names now. That would still be phenomenal. The man was an imaginative powerhouse, okay? Daredevil is another one. Can't forget Daredevil now after the Netflix series. Um, so that's his legacy. That's his life's work, okay? That's what... Um, he devoted his life to doing, creating characters and creating the stories that they were going to go into, okay? And you can't say, okay, you can't say that this isn't a big deal. You can't say that this isn't a, a big deal, that, well, we're just changing Spider-Man's, you know, sexual orientation. It's not a big deal. He's still going to be Spider-Man. No, you can't say that. If it is so important, okay, if sexual orientation, if a person's, you know, skin color, if it's so important that, um, you, that you have to change a character, an established character, right, so that they fit in with the modern age or for representation measures, then you can't say that it's not a big deal because if it wasn't a big deal, then you wouldn't have to do it in the first place. So obviously, it is a big deal. And what this gets down to, at the heart of it, what this gets down to is laziness. These studios are lazy because they don't want to actually expend the time and effort and energy that it would take to create new characters, to create a compelling character, to create an origin story for him, to put him in good stories. They don't want to do that. They just want to cash a check. That's all they want to do. They know, they know, okay, that particularly with Spider-Man, Spider-Man is, well, he's kind of the Mickey Mouse of Marvel, okay? Spider-Man and Mickey Mouse, they're, they're kind of like this, right? Because if Mickey Mouse is the avatar of Disney, then Spider-Man is the avatar of Marvel, even though he didn't come first. I mean, ostensibly, Captain America was created by Jack Kirby back in the 40s, and he's part of the MCU now. So he technically came first, and even Stan Lee created the Fantastic Four. There are more characters that Stan Lee created. Uh, the Fantastic Four came first, but they just don't have the weight and the cultural significance as Spider-Man does. It's hard to say why some characters uh, really hit the popular imagination and why others don't, but it is true that a lot of the Marvel characters were sort of second-rate characters, right? They I mean, they had some cartoons in the 60s and then uh, uh, in the 90s, right? Riding on the coattails of the success of Batman, the animated series. But really, it wasn't until the MCU started in 2008 that characters like Iron Man, the Incredible Hulk, and Thor, and Captain America really um, became household names again. But for all that time, Spider-Man was a household name. Everyone knew who Spider-Man was. Everyone loved Spider-Man, okay? So it's particularly true here. The studios would rather do this, you know, this goofy thing for representation and change a character, which they had absolutely no hand in creating, right? They don't have any credit to Spider-Man's creation. He doesn't belong to them at all. But, in order to do something new, in order to do something exciting, in order to be woke, in order to have representation, instead of actually taking the time to create a bisexual hero, they are just going to basically tag that onto Spider-Man, kind of plaster it, cut and paste it onto Spider-Man, so that they can ride Spider-Man's coattails to the box office. That's what the really... That's one of the first really angry, angering things about this, that it's all for money. They don't care if Spider-Man is bisexual or not. They just want the money. That's it. They don't care about the character. They don't care about Stan Lee. That's already been proven. They don't care about the LGBTQIA2 plus whatever community. They don't, okay? If any of you guys out there are watching and you identify as part of that community, Sony and the MCU do not, they don't care for you, okay? They are simply doing this for the coin. They just want to see that big fat paycheck and to bask in um, 
uh, 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 you know, uh, um, um, hagiographical um, uh, reviews from the New York Times and the LA Times and the Chicago Times and the Atlantic and Slate and Vox and everything like that. They want the money and they want the praise and the glory. That's it. That's the first really angering thing about this. The second thing, okay, the second thing is that this is really a great example of appropriation. It's really an example of appropriation. You're taking another man's work, right? Two men in this case, Stanley and Steve Ditko. And you are changing it, reforming it, to put your own stamp on it for your own end. Like we said, the praise, the glory, and uh, the money. Fortune and glory, as Indiana Jones uh, says to Short Round in uh, Temple of Doom. That's what they are doing. So... All this talk that we hear about how appropriation is bad, that if you're a white guy, right, you shouldn't be wearing a sombrero, even if it is Cinco de Mayo, even if it is Halloween. You shouldn't be wearing a sombrero. Uh-uh. School cafeterias, they shouldn't be uh, making Vietnamese or Chinese foods unless they actually have Vietnamese and Chinese chefs there to make it according to how it's made in China or Vietnam, right? Because that's appropriation. That's taking someone else's culture. That's taking someone else's work. That's taking someone else's idea and appropriating it so you can sell it to a bunch of white people and make a buck. Well, what is this? Huh? What is this, Hollywood, but appropriation, taking another man's work and changing it to fit how you want him to be for your own visions of fortune and glory Right? That's all that this is. That's the only word for it. It's appropriation. It's appropriation. And it's worse than that again, because it's not just a dish, right? It's not just a cultural uh, cuisine, right? It's not just a style or anything like that. This is an actual, this is an actual intellectual property that two men came together and created at a specific point in time in the 1960s for children. That's what really makes this. It is the greed and just the, the, the lust for prestige that Hollywood has shown in this, okay? And that's why that is a real story. That this, that's why that this makes it a story because it really kind of um, opens the door as to what else is going to be appropriated, right? Are any artists uh, safe? Are any of their works safe from Hollywood or from any sort of appropriation for uh, to meet the fads and the fashions of the time? I don't know because now the door is open. This isn't, this isn't a big deal. Marvel and the MCU, uh, that, that's the same thing. Marvel and Sony have said it's not a big deal. Appropriation isn't a big deal when it's for this particular reason, when it's for the purpose of uh, promoting the ideology. And again, they're just using that as a front. Maybe some of them believe it, maybe they don't. But again, I think that it's mostly because they want the pats on the back and because they want the money first and foremost. But... Um, it really raises that question of if any work of creation is actually safe. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet on it. I wouldn't bet on it. Now, if you are a fan of the MCU, if you're a fan of the comics, if you're a fan of Stan Lee, when this movie comes out, and it is supposed to come out in 2021, it's supposed to come out next year, then you will not see this movie if these. If this story proves to be true, again, anonymous but reliable sources, the Christian Post said, you will not see this movie because Stan Lee will mean more to you than just seeing another Sony Spider-Man movie or seeing a live-action version of Into the Spider-Verse with Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland. And I mean, honestly, I don't even know why you'd want to see a movie with the three of them in it, Into the Spider-Verse, the animated version that came out two years ago in 2018. That was phenomenal. That was a great movie. Um, probably because it didn't try to be woke. It just tried to tell a good story. Um, but also, again, I, of course, 
my prejudice is showing because I never really understood why people were ooing and eyeing over um, Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. I know he was the well, he was the first live action Spider-Man on the big screen, so maybe that had something to do with it, but he was terrible. Honestly, terrible. Tom Holland is okay. Andrew Garfield is good, but again, there are other uh, animated versions of Spider-Man that are better. Uh, Spider-Man from the Spectacular Spider-Man and again, Into the Spider-Verse are even better than Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man. So, I would hope that, again, if you are a fan of the comic, a fan of Spider-Man, or just a fan of Stan Lee, that you won't go to see this movie. If these, if the story proves to be true, you won't go to see this movie. Now, one last point. Some people have asked if this is going to spell the end of Marvel and Sony, because I think that they are kind of collaborating on this movie a little bit together. Um, I don't know. I don't know. The MCU has not had uh, a bomb as of yet. They've had some movies that have underperformed, but they have all been successful. And even when, and they've all gotten incredible reviews, even when reviewers openly said in their reviews, yeah, it's not as good as these other movies, but I'm still going to give it like a, you know, a three out of five or a four out of five because, you know, it's Marvel. Um, that kind of leads me to think that they can do whatever they want and people will still go and lap it up, especially the critics. But someone pointed out that people used to say that about Star Wars as well, right? Star Wars used to be untouchable. Star Wars could not be ruined. Even the prequels didn't even really ruin Star Wars because you could say, yeah, well, they're not that good, but it does kind of lead to the original trilogy, and that's what I'm all about anyway. Um, but then the sequels came, and now everyone is just mad, and I mean... Those movies seriously underperformed. It used to be that, oh my gosh, if you were making a Star Wars movie, it was a guaranteed box office success. Even if people, in hindsight, said, well, it's not as good as these other movies. The sequels disproved that. So again, once you cross a certain line, no franchise is safe. We'll just have to uh, wait and see and, um, yeah, kind of wait and see what else uh, Sony and the MCU have up their sleeve. But anyway, that is story number one.